Hello everyone. The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in this series include different research area in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. I am Betty Chang from the Department of Pathology, University of Cambridge, and my group works on the regulation of translation dynamics during stresses, in particular temperature and biotic stresses such as bacteria and viral infection. And I'm delighted to host today's seminar titled Visualize Translation of Bacteria and viruses at single nucleotide resolution. This session aims to promote interest in ribosome profiling, a powerful yet specialized genome-wide technique to capture global translation at any given time. Our two invited speakers, Drs. Alan Brusker and Noam Stern Genosa, are prominent world leaders in the study of bacteria and viral translation dynamics respectively, and have made extensive use of ribosome profiling in their work. By applying a modified ribosome profiling protocol to bacteria genetic mutants, Dr. Brusker and his group have recently revealed that the translation start site in bacteria is hardwired, independent of the Sharon Dalgano motif. In the world of virology, besides recent revelation on the coding capacity of the SARS CoV 2, Dr. Sturgenosa was the first to apply ribosome profiling to a virus notably human cytomegalovirus, where she revealed hundreds of novel viral elements, revealing an anticipated complexity to the HCMD coding capacity. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send your questions during the talks. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. Our first invited speaker today is Ellen Bersker, who is research associate at the Green Lab at the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics in the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. The Bersker group studies ribosome stalling and rescue in bacteria. In 2014, Ellen moved to Hopkins to work with their long-term collaborator, Rachel Green, who currently focuses on ribosome quality control and mRNA surveillance in eukaryotic systems. Although the ribosome rescue mechanism in bacteria and eukaryotes are quite different, they benefit from working together on shared fundamental questions and new experimental approaches. The bacteria studies in the birth script group continue to be supported by independent NIH funding. Alan has refined the ribosome profiling method in bacteria and archaea in order to allow translation at codon level resolution and to discover small proteins encoded in the genome. And now we'll hand over to Alan for his talk. All right, thanks, Betty. I'm happy to be here. Um, so my lab works on protein synthesis in bacteria, um, and in particular, things that go wrong during that process and how they get fixed. And for a number of years, we've been very interested um, in things that cause ribosomes to stall as they translate along an mRNA, things like rare codons, which are decoded slowly, um, and amino acid sequences that interfere with their own translation and pause ribosomes. So when ribosome profiling came out, we were very excited to use it to look at ribosome pauses across the transcriptome. Um, so we've been doing this for about 10 years, um, and I'll tell you a couple of different stories today. The first one is about what we've learned about ribosome pausing and some methodological changes that we've made to the protocol in bacteria to make um, the resolution higher. I'll also tell you about using ribosome profiling to annotate genomes and find new ORFs in bacteria. Um, and finally, as Betty mentioned, we've done some work on understanding the role of shine organo motifs in initiation, and I'll tell you a quick vignette about that as well. So first, just a quick overview of the method as it, as it looks in bacteria. So we grow up cultures of bacteria and harvest the cells and lyse them. And then um, we arrest translation by adding antibiotics into the lysis buffer so that the ribosomes aren't moving and they represent um, where they were in the cell and they're not running off in vitro. 
we then um, treat this lysate with nucleases that digests all the RNA, which is not protected by ribosomes. And that leaves you with these ribosome protected footprints. We isolate the RNA, um, run the RNA on a gel and isolate ribosome footprints um, of a particular size. And then uh, we clone these and sequence them using the Illumina chemistry. And this is a wonderful, powerful technique. We had a, a genome-wide view of where all the ribosomes are and all the messages at a single time point. Um, it's been a, a wonderful thing for us. So just a few things to note about how it applies in bacteria. First is that um, in yeast, ribosome footprints are always 28 nucleotides. Um, and that's true in most eukaryotes. But in bacteria, they're, they're very... Um, broadly distributed. There are lengths of all different kinds. There are footprints which are as short as 15 and as long as 40. So if you're working in bacteria, we strongly recommend isolating very broadly um, so that you're not losing information from these footprints. The second thing is um, how you harvest the cells in arrest translation is really important. So you can imagine just taking a bacterial culture, spinning it down in a centrifuge in the cold room for five minutes, ribosomes are going to change. Um, before you harvest the cells. So early on, people started adding antibiotics to the media before they harvested the cells to arrest everything um, in the cell before harvesting. And it turns out that this leads to some problems. So what, what I'm showing here are ribosome profiling data on thousands of genes, and I've lined up all the genes at zero. Um, and then you take the average ribosome density. So this is a so-called metagene plot. Um, so in a, in a sample which is not treated with antibiotics, you can see that their ribosomes sort of equally spread across open reading frames or downstream of the start codon. But if you add chloramphenicol to the media before you harvest, what you see is an enrichment of ribosome density at the five prime end of the open reading frame. And this comes from the fact that um, some ribosomes are going to be trapped by chloramphenicol. Um, along this open reading frame, but other ribosomes are going to keep coming on here and initiating at the start codon, and then they're going to go for a few codons before they get arrested by chloramphenicol, and the result is you should load all these ribosomes in the five prime end. So we also strongly recommend that you don't add antibiotics in bacteria um, prior to harvesting the cells because this can interfere with quantitation and all sorts of other problems. Um, so, in particular, I'm interested in ribosome pausing and, and stalling, as I told you, and we found that chloramphenicol also induces sequence-specific pauses at certain codons, in alanines and glycines and serines. So, this is bad because this is now interfering with the signal that I care about. So, we developed a method to stop ribosomes in the lysis buffer without any antibiotics, and basically, we just added very high concentrations of magnesium or sodium chloride, and the salt concentrations are such that they will trap the ribosomes in one state so they can't move. There are no antibiotics required. So we know that ribosomes are pausing as they're decoding serine codons in this sample. Um, and so we should see a pause when the serine codons are lined up in the ribosomal A site. So we have three different libraries here we made with different lysis buffers. What I've done is line up all the serine codons here at zero and then take the average ribosome intensity. So it's sort of like a meta gene plot, but for codons, or a meta codon plot, if you will. And what you can see is, in these high salt buffers with high magnesium or high sodium chloride, there's a single strong peak right here. This is representative of the, um, a ribosome with a serine codon in the A site. But with the old sort of buffer that we used to use with chloramphenicol in it, the signal is spreading out because Translation isn't completely stopped in vitro, and this signal, which was like this, is spreading out to um, further downstream. So using these high salt buffers can give you much better resolution for looking at ribosome pauses. So we also learned that the way that you harvest the cell is very important. So we got away from adding antibiotics, we got away from centrifugation, we were just filtering cultures, and you can filter 200 mils of bacteria in 30 seconds or a minute, and then we would scrape the cells off of the filter and put them in liquid nitrogen really fast. And we thought this was pretty great. Uh, but it turns out that it's inducing a stress response in the bacteria, um, which lowers the levels of amino acylated serine tRNA and glycine tRNA. And so it's inducing ribosome pauses at serines and glycines. So here is some data from a filtered sample and shown in blue. Again, a metacodon plot with serines at, at zero. You can see that the average ribosome density is higher here when the serine codon is in the A site because the ribosomes are decoding serine very slowly. 
Um, okay, when we came up with another another method um, to harvest the samples, which is just to take 50 mils of culture and spray it directly into liquid nitrogen. And then we can take these frozen pellets that come out, put them in a cryo mill and grind them, pellet the ribosomes, and then carry on with ribosome profiling. So there's no filtering, no centrifuging, just direct freezing. And when we do that, um, then these pauses that we used to see in serine codons go away. So this, um, this is not only a problem in bacteria, but really any organism where things are growing really fast, um, and you might have a stress response on the order of 30 seconds that might change what translation is looking like. All right, so now that we have these new buffers and new ways of harvesting, um, how does that change what we see in terms of the pausing landscape? Um, so here are the pauses that we see with our new setup. I'm showing two libraries, one on this row and the second on the lower row. Um, and all pauses that codons for all 20 amino acids here sort of on the x-axis. And, and what you see are um, the, the, the redder the color, the stronger the pause. Um, so when proline codons are in the A site in these two libraries, you can see that there's a pause. There's also a pause for proline codons in the P site and in the E site. And um, it turns out this is consistent with what we know about rates of translation in vitro. We know that proline um, is a bad amino acid. It, peptidal, it, it undergoes peptidal transfer very slowly. Um, we also see pauses in glycine um, and to some extent aspartate, and that's also consistent with the biochemistry that we know. And I'm not, I'm not going to show you this, but we can see um, ribosomes pausing at rare codons as well. So we're finally, after all these years, able to um, a single codon resolution and, and high precision detect uh, weak uh, pauses during translation. All right, um, so moving on to a slightly different topic. Uh, ribosome profiling is a wonderful tool for annotating genomes. And um, in bacteria, we know there are lots of small open reading frames, um, fewer than 50 codons typically, which are not called by um, uh, automated annotation engines because they're too short. But we know that many of these things are expressed and, and doing biology. So in the last few years, uh, my lab working with Gigi Stortz and also Shura Menken's lab um, have used ribosome profiling to identify small opening reading frames in E. coli K12. Um, we reported 40 new um, opening reading frames even in E. coli K12 and verified that they really are being expressed. So, you know, here, for example, we have this gene core A, an annotated gene. You can see ribosome footprints on it. It's getting translated, but there's also footprints upstream of this. So the question is, um, where are these footprints coming from? What open reading frame is leading um, to the synthesis, and this can be a little bit um, difficult to, to parse out. So our group and Shore Mankin's group have identified a number of antibiotics um, useful in annotating genes. Again, so here's an open reading frame. In an untreated sample, you just see ribosome uh, footprints all across this open reading frame. Um, if you treat with ritapamulin, uh, this is an antibiotic which binds to ribosomes and traps them at start codons. It doesn't interfere with elongating ribosomes. So all the elongating ribosomes run off. And then when you do ribosome profiling, you see only initiation complexes. So this basically will tell you where all the start codons are, all the initiation complexes across the transcriptome. It's similar to Harringtonin or lactamidomycin in eukaryotic systems, but those don't work in bacteria. It's only the last few years that we've had these molecules that do work in bacteria. Um, so Shura Menken developed a type of Moulin. Um, we've also used ANC-112, um, which will do the same thing. Menken Lab has also another antibiotic called Epidacin, which traps ribosomes at stop codons, as you can see here. Now, when you do that, there are other ribosomes that pile up behind them, and then other ribosomes that sort of frame shift and read in the three prime UTR. So these data are a little bit noisy, but the Menken Lab found that if you treat with pyromycin, you can release all these elongating ribosomes, um, whereas the apodacin um, trapped ones are stuck. And so now you can cleanly annotate um, the stop codons as well. So these, these tools are really helpful for figuring out um, which open reading frame ribosome profiling reads are coming from and annotating all the start sites and stop sites. So just um, to share an example, back to this uh, core A gene that I showed you before, there's ribosome density upstream of that. Where is it coming from? 
So it, it could be from any of these three frames. I'm showing stop codons here as, as big bars and putative start codons, AUG or GUG, are small bars. And this density is sort of right here. So you know, you might say well, it could be from this reading frame, but there's no start codon. It could be from this reading frame, but we're not getting all of it. Maybe it's from this reading frame. It's 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 hard sometimes to, to decide what ribosome density is coming from what open reading frame. But if you have a sample which is treated with a chapamulin, then you see that the start codon is right here. That corresponds to this reading frame. We call this gene um, that we found YS. GD, um, and it turns out we we didn't have a start codon because it initiates at a UUG codon. That happens very rarely, but it does happen sometimes in E. coli. Um, so this this is the opening reading frame, which is is um, at play here, and it has a nice shine Nogano um, upstream of it. So all of this is just to say um, we are now in possession of tools that will allow us to. Um, do better genome annotations experimentally for all kinds of bacteria. Um, and um, there's a review that I uh, published with Shora Mankin in Journal of Bacteriology um, that you can, you can go and find if you're curious about that. All right, um, so finally, I wanna tell you a, a quick story of how we've used ribosome profiling to better understand how initiation works. So um, as you know, there are shine Delgano um, sequences in mRNAs. They're G-rich and they're upstream of an AUG. And by direct base pairing with a ribosomal RNA, they recruit 30S subunits that, that then um, cause initiation to happen here. So this does two things. The shine Delgano promotes the efficiency of initiation here. Um, and it also selects this AUG over and against these other AUGs that don't have shine Delgano sequences. Um, so uh, typically, when you when you get further away from this consensus sequence, um, then you have less binding energy, less affinity, um, and the initiation rates go down. So we wanted to see if this holds true across the genome. And with ribosome profiling, we can calculate a translational efficiency value for every mRNA. And this is um, taking ribosome profiling data and then dividing it by the number of reads in an RNA-seq experiment. So you can think about it as the number of ribosomes per RNA, basically, and that indirectly reports on initiation rates because initiation is thought to be rate limiting, elongation. So how many ribosomes you have mostly depends on how fast you're loading them. All right, so that uh, translational efficiency then is on the y-axis and we can calculate for every mRNA the strength of its shine Delgarno using computational um, pair pairing of the RNA and ribosomal RNA. So you would expect that a strong shine Delgarno sequence here would lead to a high translational efficiency with lots of ribosomes on it, and a low um, affinity shine Delgarno sequence would have a lower translational efficiency. Okay, so here are the data. Um, it turns out there's very little or no correlation, and this isn't my fault. Um, this is true of many different samples, many different labs over a number of years. So this suggests that the shine Delgarno sequence isn't that important um, in translational initiation, and that's kind of a scandal, so we wanted to take a deeper look at this. Um, and my postdoc, Kazuki Saito, had the idea of mutating the ribosome, so he's changing the anti-shine Delgarno sequence in 16S, which becomes part of the 30S subunit, and this is what's pairing with the mRNAs. So uh, the wild type is a C-rich sequence in the anti shine Delgarno, and a couple of labs have previously replaced that with this G-rich or this G-rich sequence, and they found that these ribosomes are largely inactive, but you can restore activity on a reporter gene by just introducing a complementary shine Delgarno sequence to this new ASD. So we made these two mutants, and we also made this um, a ribosome mutant, which has A's in it instead. We thought this might be interesting because um, it would be really poor at, at base pairing. All right, so Kazuki um, expressed ribosomes with these anti shine Delgarno mutants. Um, and they were also um, part of a 16S that includes an MS2 aptamer. And this is just a tag that allows us to pull down these ribosomes specifically and do ribosome profiling on them. And we can then compare that to ribosome profiling done specifically on the wild type ribosomes. Okay, so when you have wild type ribosomes, 
um, there is little or no correlation between channel garner strength and translational efficiency. This is what I showed you before. And remember that this, this is um, dependent on all the mRNA features, not just the shine Nogano sequence, but also the mRNA's structure and folding um, and all kinds of other things. All right, then when we use the mutant ribosomes, um, we see sort of an anti-correlation here, a negative correlation, where the stronger the shine Nogano, the lower the translational efficiency. And um, these ribosomes are responding to everything in the mRNA except the shine Nogano because they can't pair with it. And then we can take the wild type and subtract the mutant numbers. Um, and this effectively gets rid of everything else so that we're only looking at the shine Dalgarno um, effects. And when we do this, now we have a strong correlation that the mRNAs that have strong shine Dalgarnos are being translated better. Um, and this is what you would expect. Um, and this is consistent with a role for shine Dalgarnos in fine tuning the efficiency of translation. Um, but we suspect that, that there are other factors that are more important at play, and that's why in the wild type case, you don't see that it's sort of masked by mRNA structure and other effects. So that's about um, efficiency. What can we say about start codon selection? Are shine Dalgarnos required um, to have the correct initiation at this AUG, but not at these other AUGs? All right, so we can get at that using this drug ritapamulin that I told you about, which traps ribosomes at start codons. So here are wild-type ribosomes. I've taken annotated genes here. Here are the canonical start sites. Remember, when you treat with ritapamulin, all the elongating ribosomes run off, and you're left with just ribosome density on the start codons. So wild-type ribosomes are finding canonical start codons, no problem. What about the, the A ribosomes that have an anti shinogono mutant? So it turns out they are also finding the canonical star codons uh, here in green without much trouble. But maybe they're making other mistakes, and there are other places where they're AUGs, and they're reading those as well. So we found AUGs that are not um, canonical star codons, where there's typically no initiation. These are just in the middle of open reading frames and on RNAs and such. Um, when you treat with retapamulin, there's no density here because there's no initiation here in wild-type ribosomes. And um, interestingly enough, the A ribosomes are also not choosing to initiate here. So these data then show that these ribosomes, in the absence of a shine dolgano interaction, are capable of finding the canonical start sites and ignoring the non-canonical start sites. So they're doing very good at start codon selection. Um, and so we think that these start sites are sort of hardwired uh, in a way that doesn't depend on the shine dolgano interaction. Um, it might have to do with having lower RNA structure around them and higher RNA structure around these. And we're currently um, still following up investigating that. Um, but we do still believe that shine Dalgarnos are playing a role in fine tuning initiation rates. So if you're trying to express a protein and purify, purify it from E. coli, by all means, use a shine Dalgarno sequence that's stringent. All right. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Fuad Mohammed, who was a graduate student who did much of our work improving the ribosome profiling method and looking at ribosome pausing. This is Kazuki Saito, um, who did this work on the Shine Nogano sequence. And my collaborator, Rachel Green at Hopkins, um, who I've worked with for uh, 10 years or, or so now since I moved there. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, for the delightfully insightful talk. So now um, we will move to our second speaker, Dr. Noan Stern-Genossa. So Noan reserved her PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, studying the functioning of the functions of virally encoded microRNAs. She conducted her postdoctoral work with Jonathan Weissman at UCSF, California, studying the coding capacity of viruses by using ribosome profiling. She is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Weizmann Institute of Science, Israel. The goal of her research group is to combine the powerful, uh, power of novel, high-throughput methodologies with targeted experiments to uncover the processes that occur in cells during viral infection. So now I'll hand over to Noam for a talk. Thank you, Betty, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you, Alan, for introducing uh, ribosome profiling. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, the recent work we've done uh, using ribosome profiling to understand better uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection 
And I think it exemplify more generally how this uh, strong method can allow us to uh, um, achieve new insights into the processes that occur in, during infection. So I'll start by short introduction of SARS-CoV-2 life cycle. I think all of us can already well appreciate its importance. Uh, so after the virus enters the cells, one of the first things that happens is that it uh, releases a very long uh, single cell and RNA genome into the cytosol. And the first thing that happens is that this uh, positive RNA molecule will be engaged with a solar ribosome that will translate the first open reading frame which is actually regulated by a frame shift and generate two very long polyproteins that can be politically cleaved and generate a 16 non-structural proteins, and many of which will generate the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can now start replicating the genome of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. But it also has this unique uh, ability to, um, uh, to have a process that is called uh, discontinuous conscription in which a uh, different region along the genome are connected to this uh, 70 base pairs uh, leader of the SARS-CoV-2. So this generates a series of subgenomic RNAs that share the same five prime sequence. And each of these subgenomic RNAs will again engage with ribosome, generating a series of structural and accessory proteins that will allow the virus to uh, uh, finish its life cycle. And it's a very fast virus. So within eight hours, they're already virus is budding out of the cell. And obviously, the process that my lab uh, studies or interested is in this critical step in which uh, the virus used the cellular ribosome to translate its, its genome. And so uh, I'll tell you one story, but I want to highlight basically the two big advantages that we can um, use ribosome profiling in the context of infection. So the first one, I think, was exemplified really well by Ellen. And this is to really map experimentally what viral uh, genes are calling for. So by sequencing the ribosome protected fragment uh, from uh, in cells infected with diverse viruses, we can really experimentally annotate which viral genes are being translated and also quantify their expression. We've done it recently for uh, annotating the SARS-CoV-2, revealing some potentially novel accessory protein and regulatory elements. So this was done by us and by others for many viruses, and it was a very uh, powerful approach to, to accurately map viral genomes. What I want to tell you today is the second half of the story, and in this, in this slide we want to use ribosome profiling or use ribosome profiling to really map how SARS-CoV-2 uh, manipulates the host translation during viral infection. And, and this work was really a huge team effort with many people in the group uh, involved in that and basically leaving their projects and putting the full of efforts into SARS-CoV-2. But uh, really, uh, um, and the star of this work is an amazing, amazing graduate student uh, named Yara Pinter. So what we wanted to answer is a relatively simple question. And this is how host shutoff is achieved during SARS-CoV-2 infection. So host shutoff is a very com it's very common strategy that is used by diverse viruses. It has potentially two advantages for the virus. So first, by definition, the virus competes with the cell and the ribosome to translate its own mRNA. So if the virus induces shutoff of host protein synthesis, it can potentially allow more efficient translation of viral transcripts. And second, and maybe more important, uh, if the virus induced uh, if the virus induced host shutoff prevent the translation of cellular genes, it really decreases the, the ability of the cells to mount an efficient uh, antiviral immune response. And different viruses develop diverse mechanisms to interfere with host translation. And there are viruses that inhibit uh, uh, transcriptions of cellular genes, different steps at the, the processing of the mRNA, export from the nucleus to the tigersol, directly manipulating the translation machinery, or degrading cellular RNA either in the cytosol or in the nucleus. And although several SARS-CoV-2 proteins have been uh, studied by overexpression, there was no global overview of what actually happened during SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is what we were trying or aiming to do. So the first uh, step to achieve that uh, is to get in, to, to calibrate a system in which most of the cells are infected because we are averaging the signal on all the cells. So we must have conditions in which uh, the vast majority of the cells are infected. And this is what you can see here. So we calibrated infections conditions, IMY, MIO5, in which most of the CALO3 cells, which uh, 
our language identical to normal cells are really uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then we take these cells and we harvest them to uh, two libraries. One that uh, the ribosome profiling libraries that give us the overall coverage uh, of ribosome along, along different transcripts. And the second is RNA-seq that give us the RNA abundance in the cell. And so before I'll delve into what we uh, got from this measurement, there is big, one big uh, limitation of these genome-wide approaches and that these are relative approaches. They never give us the absolute level of translation. They give us relative uh, translation levels of different genes, viral or host genes. So to try and get into the absolute level of translation, we use the uh, poor mycin homolog, which is called OPP. This molecule incorporates into uh, 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 nascent chains and basically terminate translation. And then using click chemistry, we can label these uh, uh, newly generated nascent chains and measure them by microscopy or by fax. And what I'm showing you here is fax images. And so this is what we've done in uninfected color free cells and then at different time points uh, post SARS CoV 2 infection. And what you can clearly see is that within eight hours, SARS CoV 2 really significantly uh, reduced the translation capacity in infected cells. And we measure almost 80% reduction in the overall level of translation. So SARS-CoV-2 really induced a massive uh, translation block in infected cells. But then the question was, how is this divided between the host and the virus? Because this is general uh, reduction in translation. And for that, we can use the ribosome profiling measurement. So as Alan described, we can calculate something that we call translation efficiency, which reflects how well each gene is translated. Um, based on the amount of mRNA molecules it has. So we divide the number of footprints by the number of mRNA reads. And then what I'm plotting here is the uh, translation efficiency of human genes in black and the canonical viral genes in different colors. And what you can see from that is that we actually don't see any major differential uh, translation, diff the professional translation of viral transcripts. They are basically translated as efficiently as solar mRNA. If anything, they are translated a little worse than cellular mRNA. So this suggests that although there is massive reduction in translation, it's both host and viral RNA that uh, the translation is reduced. We don't have any selective preference for translating viral mRNA. So this made us focus at the RNA level. And so first, again, we have this problem of relative management. So we had to convince ourselves we don't have major changes in the amount of uh, total RNA or ribosomal RNA, which I'm not showing here. We convinced ourselves that they are not dramatically changing during the infection. And then we sequence total RNA without any uh, subtraction or selection and just look at the percentage of host and of viral and host uh, mRNAs in these uh, libraries. And this is what is plotted here. So in blue, you can see the host mRNAs, and in red, you can see the viral mRNA. And basically, very quickly, uh, the virus takes over uh, of more than 80% of the mRNA pool in infected cells. And you can really see the huge production and very quick production of viral mRNA. But what we also noticed is that there is actually a significant reduction in the amount of cellular uh, mRNA. And this suggested that maybe SARS-CoV-2 is also inducing uh, cellular mRNA degradation. You can also look at it in the level of individual genes. And this is what is plotted here. So you can see the 2,000 genes that show the most drastic change uh, during SARS-CoV-2 infection. And basically what you see is that most of the genes just went down and therefore the footprints also correspondingly went down. We have a small group of genes that was actually transcriptionally induced. And these are really enriching innate immune response genes. And I'll uh, spend my last slide talking about these genes. But overall, we see this uh, drastic reduction. And so uh, to try and it's very hard to uh, measure RNA degradation from steady state RNA measurements. But since uh, we know usually in infection degradation occurs in specific compartments, uh, we looked at whether uh, we see any specific effect on cellular transcript according to the subcellular localization. So basically what we've done, we took all the cellular transcripts and we bin them according to the uh, uh, nuclear versus cytosolic uh, localization. So here are the most cytosolic uh, transcripts and here are the more nuclear transcripts. And then we looked at each of these beams, how are they changing during the infection. And what you can see that we got the clear signatures that the genes that are mostly reduced in infection are actually the cytosolic transcripts. And this really suggests that SARS-CoV-2 is inducing a, a degradation of mRNA in the cytosol. We can also look at the mitochondrial RNA and colon RNA, which are 
presumably physically protected by the mitochondria, we can also see that indeed it looks like they are much less affected by SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this suggested SARS-CoV-2 is inducing RNA in the cytosol, but we had to measure uh, RNA half-life in infected cells. So for that, to try and do that, we used a very powerful method, which is called SLAMSIC. So it's not ribosome profiling, but it's still very valuable. Uh, and what we've done, we took uh, kind of free cells and infected or not infected them with SARS-CoV-2. Three hours post-infection, we used we added to this uh, culture for SU, which is a uridine homologue that incorporates into a newly synthesized RNA. And then we harvest uh, the RNA at one, two, three, and four hours post labeling. Uh, we treated it with fiodor acetamide, which alkylates the for SU to something that uh, uh, looks like uh, cytosine when RNA seq is being conducted. We then did RNA seq. And basically, in each of these time points, we calculated the fraction of new RNA that contains the U to C conversions and old RNA, which was there before we added the forest here. And then, by having these measurements for every gene, we can uh, calculate the half life uh, in uninfected and infected cell. And this is a very complicated experiment that actually resulted in a very simple graph, uh, which shows the half life of RNA in uninfected cells compared to infected cells. And basically, what you can see is that most of the cellular RNA is be below the diagonal, uh, really demonstrating SARS CoV 2 is inducing their degradation. And we can also show again that this is likely uh, happens in the cytosols because we can see that the RNAs that are mostly reduced during SARS CoV 2 infection are RNAs that are localized to the cytosol, whereas the nuclear RNAs seem to be uh, protected. We also noticed that uh, uh, when we look at the data is that in infected cells, we see more intronic reads that are coming from introns. And this is just one gene as an example. So you can see here the RNA-seq from uninfected cells and eight hours post-infection. You can appreciate we see more intronic reads. And of course, we can quantify it in a genome-wide manner. And indeed, we see that we have an increase in the number of intronic reads compared to exonic reads as we go uh, forward in infection. Uh, but after we realized that there is massive RNA uh, degradation, we, we kind of uh, hypothesized that maybe this incre apparent increase in intronic reads actually uh, mostly reflect the fact that we have a degradation of mature cytosolic RNAs. Uh, and so to try and understand if this increase in intronic exonic ratio is coming from actually increasing intronic reads, we quantify the number of intronic reads and exonic reads relative to RNA levels, which we assume are not drastically changing during infection. We have evidence for that. And what this shows is that actually uh, intronic reads are not really going up in infection. If anything, they are going a little bit down. And what's really going down is that the exonic reads are going down. And this is why we have a relative increase in intronic versus exonic reads. We can also look and see which genes are actually showing this increase in intronic reads. And this is quantified here in these bars. And what you see is that the genes that are really drastically going down during the infection are the genes that are showing uh, increasing the intronic reads relative to exonic reads, whereas the genes that are actually being transcription induced and supposedly are now being processed don't actually show any drastic change in, the, in their exonic and tronic ratios. And this is also can be seen in a genome-wide uh, manner. We can show that the, actually the, the genes that shows the most drastic increase in intronic reads are the genes that show the most drastic reduction in their half-life in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this made us conclude that the increase in intronic reads compared to exonic reads is mostly driven by this uh, massive uh, degradation of material cellular transcripts in the cytosol. So the big question is who is degrading these, uh, uh, these cellular RNAs? And the immediate suspect is NSP1, which is the main shot of, of uh, alpha and beta coronaviruses. And there were already a series of papers uh, about SARS-CoV-2 NSP1 demonstrating that it can physically uh, block the entry channel of mRNAs into the ribosome and basically uh, block translation. But there were also seminal uh, papers from uh, Shinji Makino's group and the original uh, uh, SARS, and he showed NSP1 also induced uh, RNA degradation. So we wanted to test if the degradation we see could be explained by NS SARS-CoV-2 NSP1. And so what we've done, we uh, use the reporter assay. Uh, so we have a GFP, which is a clone with a control 5 This is a cellular 5 
OG field that is uh, expressed with the five prime ETR that uh, comes from the source of two genomes, so the five prime leader. And then we express together with this GFP and M cherry as a control, and you can see the GFP is expressed both in the control and when it has the uh, COV2 leader. But then when we express NSP1, uh, it completely blocks the expression of the GFP reporter. This was shown by other people, but we can actually show that we can completely rescue it if we have this five prime uh, leader of SARS-CoV-2. And this is also measured by fax. Uh, but what was uh, important for us is that we could show that this massive reduction in the GFP expression is also associated with a 20-fold reduction in the GFP transcript level, suggesting NSP1 induced induce, uh, cellular mRNA degradation. And this is almost completely rescued when we have the five prime, the SARS-CoV-2 five prime leader. So this suggests that um, uh, basically SARS-CoV-2 five prime leader protects the viral RNA from NSP1 mediated degradation. And we think this can explain how within eight hours post-infection, 90% of the mRNA molecule, almost 90% of the mRNA molecule in infected cells are coming from the virus. So, so far I showed you that there is general block in translation. There is massive degradation specifically to cellular transcript, but we can also look at the dynamic of the translation changes uh, during infection using our ribosome profiling measurements. And so this is what we've done here. So for every cellular gene, we calculate the relative translation efficiency, uh, and we basically looked at the genes that showed the most drastic or uh, strongest uh, changes uh, along SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is the clustering that is presented here. So we clustered the cellular genes according to their change in the translation efficiency. And what, the, what was, that came out from that was a very clear and interesting signature is that we have a group of genes that show very uh, drastic reduction in the relative translation efficiency along SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these genes are actually the genes that are transcriptionally induced. So these are all the innate immune um, uh, genes, specifically interferon-stimulated genes. You can see that they're going up at the mRNA level, but the footprints are actually not changing at all. And that's why our measurements suggest that the relative translation efficiency is going down. And this can also be seen in specific examples. So you can see, for example, IL-6 and IL-8, at blue, you can see the mRNA, so the cells are sensing that they are infected and are producing these cytokines, but the footprints are really flat, they are not changing. So this suggested that uh, somehow newly generated transcripts actually don't make it to the ribosome. So they are being made, but they never engage with ribosome. And one possible explanation for this uh, phenotype could be if SARS-CoV-2 inhibits uh, cellular mRNA export. So to try and test that, we, um, use subcellular fractionation to sequence uh, nuclear and cytosolic RNA uh, in uh, uninfected in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells and then did RNA-seq to look at the sub changes in subcellular localization. Uh, and basically this is what we've, we've done. So here you can see the cytonucleus fracture in uninfected cells uh, compared to infected cells. And what you can see is that basically in infection we have much more nuclear RNA and specifically, the genes for which we saw the most significant reduction in the relative translation efficiency are marked in, in, in purple. And you can see that they are even more uh, repressed compared to the rest of the cellular transcript. So this suggests that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 inhibits uh, uh, nuclear mRNA export. And I should say that um, there was a recent uh, work from the uh, Fontura group that also showed uh, SARS-CoV-2 inhibit uh, uh, mRNA export from the nucleus. And they suggest that this function is mediated by NSP1, which makes NSP1 a super uh, interesting and important protein. But we think overall this inhibition of nuclear uh, mRNA export can explain why infected cells really fail to launch a robust antiviral response. So with that, I'll conclude. And I hope I showed you or uh, this try to show you how SARS-CoV-2 used a multi-pronge multi approach to shut, off, to shut off host protein synthesis. And so we think the shutoff is achieved by three potentially independent mechanisms. First, general reduction in the translation capacity. We don't think it's uh, specifically uh, targeting cell RNA. Second, massive RNA degradation, which is mediated, likely mediated by NSP1, which is specifically targeting cell RNA transcript. And third, uh, we see this inability of immune transcript to reach the ribosome, likely because there is a, a 
uh, block of the import of cell or transcripts out of uh, the nucleus. But I think overall, this study really exemplify again how we can use ribosome profiling to really decipher the way these uh, viruses work. So just want to thank the amazing people that done this work. So this work was led by Yara, Avi, and Aaron. Uh, Yara and Avi, uh, Yara and Aaron made most of the computational analysis, and Avi made a lot of the experiments. It was initially initiated by a super talented uh, student, Ronnie Winkler, which is now doing a postdoc in Charlie Rice lab, and was co-supervised with Michal and with help with Tal. Everything was done in really close collaboration with the Israel uh, Biological uh, Research uh, uh, Unit, uh, with Nir and Tomer, and with our collaborator at Schweitzman. Uh, and thank you, Betty, again for this uh, nice forum. Thank you very much for the wonderful and topical talk. So we will now um, invite Alan back to the question and answering session. So if you have, once again, if you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the, on the image on the screen. So our first question is actually for Alan from Andrew First. So first of all, fantastic talk, Alan. Is there a analogous drug to um, epidetin that will arrest translating ribosomes in eukaryotes? And can you differentiate different stages of the coding in bacteria, similar to anisomycin profiling, et cetera, in eukaryotes? Those are very good questions. Um, I don't know of anything like apodacin that works in, um, that works in eukaryotes. Um, it's a very special antibiotic. It's a peptide antibiotic, and it, it traps the release factor um, in the ribosome and prevents recycling. Um, so I don't know of anything like that in eukaryotes. Um, so you were asking about the different decoding states. So in yeast, um, you can use different antibiotics and you get 28 mer reads, which come from one state of the ribosome and 21 mer reads that come from a different state. We have been unable to make that work in bacteria. Um, and part of the problem is that we always have just this huge pile of reads of all different kinds of sizes. Um, but we have we've not been able to make that work now. So um, actually, following on to Alan's last sentence, it brings to the next question, um, jointly asked by Morgan Feeney and again Andrew First. Is it known why ribosome footprint sites are so much more variable in bacteria compared to eukaryotes? Um, well, I can tell you that it's not the nuclease. For a while, we thought that the problem was the nuclease we were using, but that's not the problem. Um, we do know that the mRNA fragments will base pair with the anti shine dalgono sequence um, at the 5' prime end of the fragment, and that can change the size of the fragment. Um, fragments which um, are G-rich at their 5' prime end tend to be longer, so they're not getting degraded by the nucleases as well. So that might be part of it. Um, but it seems to be something sort of unique about the bacterial ribosome. So our next question is from Jun Jae Gao. So our other studies have shown that, this is for known by the way, other studies have shown that SARS-CoV-2 5-prime UTR could confirm resistance to nsd one mediated translation shutoff. Can you speculate why this is not recapitulated in the uh, ribosic the, the data? Uh, so, so first, I, I know, I mean, there are several studies that suggested uh, in the presence of NSP1, viral transcripts are translated uh, more efficiently, or like it's actually promoting the translation of viral transcripts. There are also studies that show in vitro that NSP1 actually blocks the translation of both viral, both viral or both transcripts that contain vi viral 5 prime leader and cellular transcripts. So this is a very debatable uh, area. Um, so what we can say is that in, vi in vivo, or at least in infected cells, we don't see any drastic changes in the translation efficiency of viral transcripts compared to cellular transcripts. I think the, the, the real answer will come uh, when we'll use uh, an NSP1 mutant, uh, because right now it's possible that other uh, 
factors are affecting our measurement uh, of uh, viral translation efficiency. Uh, for example, we know a lot of the genomic RNA is actually not accessible for the ribosome because it's sitting in the replication compartment and it's likely to also for a lot of the subgenomic RNA. Uh, so I think the, it's still an open question whether NSP1 is really inducing the translation of, of viral transcripts. I can just say that in the reporter essays that we've done, we actually also see that when we have the five prime leader and we transcript with NSP1, it's not just that it's not blocking the translation. Actually, we always see a little bit of uh, increase in the translation. And so um, it's something we are, we are very interested in, not just us, I think many people. You should also remember that the NSP1 physically blocks the entry channel of the ribosome. So it's very hard to imagine how it really helps uh, uh, translation of, of viral transcripts. And so maybe it's also a matter of competition. Uh, that's, to, that's to do. Um, we have another question for Noam from Julie Aston. Do you have any tips for trying to detect different translations? for the lot many um, small open reading frames in the viral genome where they are so numerous and overlapping? So I personally don't have uh, my own specialized tricks. There is already a lot of uh, literature. Uh, so first, we all, I mean, many of us use uh, something that is very similar to what uh, Alan was describing. We use lactidomycin and aritonin, which basically affect only translation initiation. And then we give the cells uh, uh, some time in inc the incubator, the ungrating ribosome are chasing out of the messenger RNA. And then we get this strong enrichment in translation initiation sites. So this allows us to get confidence about where there is translation in initiation. We also, uh, we are not that lucky to have such a strong signal at the stopcodon. So what we usually um, do is use this translation initiation mark and then look at the uh, frame information of the rest of the footprints, whether it really supports that there is an, an additional frame that is being translated. Uh, again, there are uh, some uh, very powerful computational methods uh, not developed by us, uh, uh, but de developed by others, the Ofrater, Price. And so these are, I think, very uh, powerful tools. And the next question is also about yeah. analysis. That is from Lars Sharp for Alan. Regarding the hard wiring, we tested some years ago. If mRNA secondary structures can play a role in start codon recognition, how would you analyze that? Um, yeah, there, there are some studies that suggest that RNA structure is important and that um, canonical start codons have lower structure. Um, there's some new shape data in the last few years um, that we have looked at, um, and so that you know there's some experimental um, ways of looking at RNA structure now. And I think I think you know, this, this is an art discovery, right? Um, but I think it, the, the trends all all point to RNA structure being very important. And another question for Alan: Is bacter in bacterial gene clusters? I often come across combined start stop codons for overlapping reading frames, such as ATGA or TGA, TG. Is this understood and how these are processed by the ribosome? Yes. Um, so that's actually a very common strategy in E. coli that the, the start codon of the next gene will overlap with the stop codon of the first gene. Um, there is a whole literature suggesting that there's translational coupling, that when the subunits reach a stop codon, they can somehow reinitiate and then keep going. Um, we have done a little bit of work on that um, by interfering with recycling, by breaking the recycling factor. Um, so, you know, my, my guess is, um, very generally speaking, that um, translational coupling on operons like that is probably going through changing RNA structure rather than by having a, an actual, you know, the very same ribosome initiate and keep going. Um, anyway, that's my, that's my guess for now. And we have very last question, also by Andrew first to Noan. So first of all, it's a fantastic talk. Sorry I've, if I've missed it, but is the mechanism of MSP1 mediated 
degradation of mRNA known, and is it linked to NSD1 ribosome interaction? Uh, so, uh, yes and no, whether it's known. So there is really uh, several amazing people from uh, several amazing paper, papers from uh, Shinji Makina's group and the original SARS. And he shows uh, that yes, the binding to the ribosome is needed to induce the RNA cleavage. And so he has a mutant that uh, doesn't bind to the ribosome and then there is no cleavage. But he also has a mutant that actually uh, still binds to the ribosome, but doesn't induce cleavage. So these are, I think this is the proof that this is two, these are two independent functions. And we actually now have the same mutant in SARS-CoV-2 and, and it works the same, unsurprisingly. Uh, it's still a big mystery, and I think many people are, are interested in how NSP1 is inducing degradation. It's very likely that by itself it's not an endonucleus. And so I think the, the, the leading hypothesis is that it recruits something, and something probably that is, my smartest guess will be that it's something that is usually used cross translationally to degrade RNA, uh, but um, we have no clue what is actually degrading the RNA. So unfortunately, it is time to wrap up, and we apologize for the lack of time to answer all the questions. The conversation can actually continue online, so do follow at Biochemstock and at PP Publishing on Twitter. And we will also welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers for to feature in the biochemistry focused webinar series. If you have any ideas for a webinar in 2022, we invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar. Also, if you have missed any of the 30 plus webinars that we have run as part of the series, or would like to watch them again, like the one today, please visit our website or YouTube channel. You can find more information about the webinars, propose your webinar, and watch previous recording on www.alchemistry.org webinars. And I want to just highlight that in these new and challenging times, it is more important than ever to stay connected and engage with the biosciences community. So joining the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists is a great way to stay connected with your fellow molecular bioscientists. And members can take advantage of a variety of benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of their journals, and more. You can find all of this information again in the Biochemical Society website. And finally, I would like to thank both speakers for their fabulous talk. All of you for listening and the society for organizing this seminar. Goodbye.